All right, well, now uh, we're going to follow up with this uh, super exciting panel. Uh, once again, thank you, everybody, for attending. I love the conversation was happening during lunch, we chatting about our experiences, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, so today we have with us uh, Chris Westerholt. That's right. Is the head of developer experience at ThoughtWorks. We have Michelle Alexander, sorry, a senior director of engineering and infrastructure at Seed and platform at Seed Geek. We have with us Stefana Mueller, SVP of Cloud Infra Ops at Own Company, not her own company, but Own Company. <laughs> <laughs> And I couldn't help it, sorry. <laughs> and we have Jared Belmore, uh, Principal Solutions Architect at Guardian Life. Um, so could we, we mind introducing more about each of you as, as we as the first part of this? I'll go. Yeah, so nice to meet everybody. Uh, like uh, Ramiro said, Chris Westerhold, I am the Head of Developer Experience at ThoughtWorks. Uh, been in technology 20 years or more, uh, but over the last couple of years, I've really focused on, you know, kind of engineering effectiveness. How do you drive better kind of outcomes for your engineering organization as a whole, kind of a top-down approach, uh, but then also focusing on kind of developer workflow optimization, developer experience, whatever words you want to use these days. But it's really that kind of grassroots, bottom-up, developer-centric point of view when, you, when it comes to optimization. And, and when I think of, you know, really driving better outcomes for engineering, it really takes, a, takes kind of both of those. And um, yeah, so it's really nice to be here. It's nice to get a chance to, to chat with everybody and uh, such a great panel. So appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so I'm Michelle Alexander. I have been over at SeatGeek for about four and a half years. And most of my time there and most of my career has been in product engineering teams and leading product engineering teams. Uh, about two years ago, I started standing up a couple of what we call foundation teams. So think about the, uh, the shell of your app or the shell of mobile apps, websites, all that. Um, and setting up some DevX initiatives. And then just about a year ago, I actually shifted into the platform org, getting an opportunity to, to go deep and help that org grow. Hi everyone, I'm Stefana Muller. I work for Own Company. We're a SaaS data company. We could talk about that later. My role there is as SVP of Infrastructure and Operations. And part of that role is developer experience and op optimization. Um, basically, the tools that my team builds and enables, enables the developers to get things to prod quickly, um, or rather not quickly, as my team would say. Uh, so we, we've felt all the pain. Um, and in a few different companies, I've helped fix the pain. So so I'd love to be on this panel I'm learning more from everybody who's gone through that process. Hi, I'm Jared Belmore, uh, Guardian Life, and um, I've been a software engineer for about 20, uh, 20 or so odd years, uh, working in primarily the insurance space and financial uh, services. Um, so started my career as, as really sort of application delivery uh, team. Uh, after quite some time there, moved into some of the more infrastructure as code, you know, classic DevOps. Um, you know, working with tools like GitLab and, and Jenkins and various other uh, tools and, and moved into kind of Terraform as, as, as well as kind of various now platform engineering type uh, tools. So to get started, um, how about we talk about one of the questions I always get is what is the motivation that you and your teams had to start investing in, in developer experience in platform? Like what, what was that moment when you were like, yes, this is something we need to put time, money, resources into it. Um, who wants to go first, like Stefana? Sure, um, so number of incidents was the first thing that we looked at. And also the, the onboarding speed for new employees. So number of, number of incidents is an after effect. The onboarding speed for employees was how quickly can we grow this company? At two companies I've, I've been at, we've been late stage startups growing rapidly, needing to onboard people very quickly, how do I get them ready and able to do their job week one and not week 27? This is something I don't know why we thought startups were faster at. They're not. They don't have any documentation. They do not have environments available for you. You have to figure it out yourself and bootstrap your own environment. Um, that was where that type of initiative was generated for both teams, both companies that I'm referring to in my mind. Um, so those were the the reasons for developer efficiency for those types of initiatives to start um, and why they continued is we felt that not only getting them onboarded quickly, but giving them the right environment to test in that full shift left that we've all been, you know, dreaming over. Um, that's the only way you're going to get there is giving them the full environment that they can test in, they can work in, they can do the work that they need to do it and then move on into the upper environments. And because I own prod today, 
which is a stressful environment. You're, you got the pager? Okay, just making sure. Uh, but that is, you know, it's really important to me of the high quality of software, even though I don't own the engineering organization. Interesting. And Michelle, do you have a similar experience? Yeah, pretty similar. Um, so SeatGeek is a late stage startup. Uh, at the beginning of the pen or before the pandemic, we were going through an intentional kind of change in how we ran engineering. So there were some departures. And then the pandemic happened and a bunch of engineers, understandably so, were like, I'm not staying at a live events company during a pandemic, I can get a job elsewhere. So we had kind of a brain drain of the long tenured startup folks who could build things quickly because they knew where everything was. Uh, and then we were just really slow because the systems were all over the place. Product market fit was the name of the game, not consistency. So we knew we needed to scale our team back up um, and we needed to bring on a bunch of people and let them actually be effective. Uh, so that was kind of the beginning of the real uh, investment in DevX. It's very interesting. Uh, Jared, you work for a much larger organization. Are you seeing some of the same things or is, is the world yeah. different there? Yeah, and it's, it's kind of interesting. So Guardian's about 150 years old or something like that. And obviously a, a large um, uh, financial company and, and you know, thousands of employees. And, and I think one of the it's interesting when I was reading that question for, for to prepare for this, I was thinking to myself, would, the answer would really depend on who you ask in an organization, right? And I think that's kind of one of the biggest struggles that we have is I think there's there's competing motivations as to why you might want to invest in in this type of experience. So on the one hand, you know, develop, developer empowerment and, and productivity is obviously the, the positive reason for it and enabling high performing teams to do their jobs better. Uh, whereas at our organization, I think there's a lot of folks who kind of look at it, what I would consider in a, in a different light, in a negative light, which is more protecting the organization from low performing teams that might be doing something wrong. Uh, and I think that's not necessarily the, the healthiest way to, to look at it. And I think it, it ends up leading to a lot of, um, you know, problems and challenges that, that we've had. So, you know, definitely, you know, personally, you know, I echo a lot of the, the same thoughts, which is, you know, really, why should our jobs be so hard? Like it's, it's 2024 now, like we should not be struggling to build software to build quality software anymore but yet we still are as an industry so i think that's where that's you know what personally excites me about it but again it's it's really difficult because i think a lot of bigger companies especially are like ours where it's not necessarily the, the sort of purest reasons as to why we would want to do this interesting so so chris uh, yeah. i like you're in the panel because you have a different point of view you come from the analyst world yeah i'm sure you talk to companies in different stages of this What's your take on this? Yeah, I, I get the opportunity and pleasure sometimes to talk to a lot of different companies. And, and I always refer this back to kind of the development triangle. So, you know, with any good triangle, you get to pick two of the sides and the other one's dictated for you. And so if you think of the development triangle, you have your cost, speed and quality. And, you know, people tend to come at this problem from many of either, any of those sides depending on exactly the challenges that they're coming from and a startup might want to be fast and you're gonna you know you now get to pick cost which they generally don't have a lot of money and so what happens your your quality tends to fall off which is kind of what we've already referred to a little bit but you might be in an older company that has had a a data breach or something like that where it's like oh my gosh the only thing i care about now is quality and i don't have a lot of money so you now everything grinds to a halt, which I'm which I'm sure we've seen before. And you know, you can kind of look at any of those those challenges. And you know, in a lot of ways, developer productivity is equal to the you know kind of the outcome of your organization. What are you trying to optimize for? And you know, developer experience plus a lot of other things will really help kind of drive that and be be that kind of push towards making changes inside of, of an organization. Thank you. So, you know, we have a group of people here at different stages of this journey. Some might be starting, thinking about pushing initiatives. Others are, are more mature. Uh, most of you here have gone through this already. Um, can you share some like stories of what worked, what backfired, like anything you can tell yourself, hey, if I'm going to be going through this again, do this or, or stay away from doing this kind of thing. I know, Michelle, you want to go first? Yeah. So I would say something that backfired is we got um, all of our R&D organization bought in on these kind of improvements. When people aren't going to live events, you have more time to spend on that. So everyone was like, yes, this is what we should be doing. Uh, full steam ahead. And everyone ran full steam ahead in 10 different directions. Progress was made, but not 
enough that felt impactful. And sometimes you're working against each other unintentionally. Um, so the thing I would say is get that excitement and top down like, yes, have the time to do this, but also give some structure and guidance on like, let's focus our energy in this one direction first so we can have this big impact and then move on to the next. Anybody else here? Let's see. Yeah, and I mean, I, I would say for us uh, personally, I think it's, you know, kind of goes back to Conway's laws. Everyone always likes to talk about being that, you know, the whatever platform you're going to build is really going to be a, uh, a sort of representation or, or, or dictated by the ownership of all the various underlying tools at your organization. So, you know, one thing that um, we did not do that we should have done at the beginning was really kind of not necessarily have a reorganization, but really sort of rethink some of that ownership around, okay, yes, like this team shouldn't own Bitbucket and that team own, you know, deliver, uh, Jenkins and that team owns SonarCube. And, you know, because then what we end up having is, you know, 15 different teams all owning these these services that ultimately should be working in tandem, you know, really well, uh, but that, you know, each team is kind of having their own backlog and their own uh, vision of how it should work. So what ends up happening is, you know, our team ends up being kind of the glue code, right? So you're really, uh, having to interface with a lot of systems you aren't necessarily completely in charge of the decision making processes and trying to make it as good as you possibly can for the developer experience so obviously the developer experience is going to only be as good as you can make it so i think one thing that we later on did that i thought personally was was very useful and um and interesting and i'm hoping will inform kind of what we do going forward is you know going through a uh, i think we did event storming or whatever sort of ddd type practice or whatever you want to do go through and, and take a look at, okay, you know, we, we always do this for our business applications. What, what is, how does our business function? But we never really think, okay, what do we do? How do we function? So going through that exercise of actually going through an event storm and saying, okay, like what are all the different events that happened from, I wanted, you know, I'm, you could even go back to, I'm a brand new developer to, I've now contributed code in production to a, an app application. And we went through that. And that was really kind of telling around, okay, here's all of the the underlying applications that we're using and here's how they kind of all need to interface and in an ideal world you know this is what we have today where can we change this to make it better i have a, a thought about this as well i think the it's kind of similar to what you're talking about one of the things that we found really challenging is that when people owned either not enough or too many things um, there was a lot of lack of collaboration on a tool or whatnot and then there wasn't a focus. Everyone's fi focused on firefighting, fixing the thing that happened last, not a strategy of how we can make these tools better, this platform better for the rest of the engineers. So uh, recently we, we've tried a few different ways um, giving someone a project to work on, but they kept being stolen back to do work in prod or on something that was happening. Uh, recently I siphoned off three people and I said, you're not doing anything. You're not even on call. You're just going to make observability work, OK? You're going to put a logging standard out there. We're not going to throw logs into 17 different areas. We're going to put them into open search or Elastic. And, and, and they'll be unstructured or structured. I don't care, but we need to be able to use them. Everyone needs to know how this should function. Um, and guess what that happened? You know, basically it allowed the team to start building. By the way, they're not done. I'm gonna, I gave them a year and they've just started, right? So we're six months in, but it also helped cut costs significantly because we were using all these monitoring solutions in the wrong way. We were putting logs in Datadog. I mean, not that Datadog is bad, but that's extremely expensive with custom metrics. Anyone else get that bill? But this is, you know, this is what we were seeing. And, and until I had a team focused on that tool set, it wasn't working. And I was just talking to Henry about this earlier. I found that you need to break up the team a little in platform. You can't have them own everything, but you do need to have like protected time on these applications, these stacks that are so important to the engineers to make it a stack that can work for everybody. So that's just a thought that I've recently learned, finally. <laughs> So I, I would add, I add a little bit to that. So, you know, I, I, I'll talk to people and they'll, they'll tell me something like, we don't have a platform for that. And I'll say, yeah, you do. You may not have built it. You may not have built it on purpose, but there is a process and there is a platform that people are using, whatever words you want to use. And I think what, what you just called out there is a really great example is, well, you didn't really have an observability platform, but people had hacked one together and that's the way your business is operating. And 
it is almost always the most expensive way to do it. Mm -hmm. And if you're not deliberate as an organization around the things that you're trying to accomplish, you are going to have really poor results, really poor quality and really high bills at the end of the month. And one of the one of the things that I would would add on to this is kind of the concept of technical product management. Us technologists are used to things that are a bit of a mess and that are hard to handle, especially in the distributed world that we all live in now. And I actually talked to an e-commerce company the other day that legitimately didn't know how their orders were processed. And it's because they went when they were used to be a gigantic monolith that everybody understood. And now it's this whole distributed set of microservices and distributed systems and all kinds of things. And I'm being a little bit flippant when I said they didn't understand it, but like they understood how it was supposed to work. But from a technology perspective, there's very few people that could actually tell them how it worked. And thinking about, you know, technical product management and people to be able to own and mature and deliver on the business impact that is necessary from a given set of tools is incredibly critical towards being successful as an engineering organization that isn't incredibly expensive and you know really slow to deliver on things. That's, that's great. I have a follow-up question on, on this topic. Yeah, and I was telling somebody yesterday about the role of leadership in this. Like a lot of people feel like platforms need to be organic, you know, they gather, they kind of like surface, kind of what you're alluding to. Mm -hmm. And you have a you have a rogue platform, then it becomes official platform. I've seen I've seen that happen. Not sure if I could say I've seen it work, but uh, but but from your perspective, is this something that your experience is it a top down? Is it bottoms up? Like what is the right mix to building a successful platform to experience you know at scale? I think the answer is going to differ depending on your organization and knowing the dynamics of your organization. Um, the mixture that I have seen work well that I think may translate across many places is like a top-down directive that you're going to get some time, some funding, some people who you can say work on this. Um, but then you need to find your advocates, like who is going to be on that product engineering team adopting this thing first and be pretty intentional about who you grab because what you're doing is you're leveraging their influence. So if you grab an engineer who's really excited, but they don't have any track record of like making changes across their org, they're going to be a great partner. You're going to build cool things, but you may not move any further into this thing being adopted. Whereas if you grab the engineering director of your consumer organization and they're super passionate, like, yeah, they get to put their thumb on the scale and the thing's going to get done faster. So find that um, advocate and use their influence to really help push forward your work. Yeah, and I guess for, for me personally, I would say that um, leadership absolutely matters, but more importantly, the correct leadership matters. Because uh, again, to, to the point I made earlier, is that if you're going in with the wrong motivations, you're not going to be successful and you're not going to get adoption on the, the tool, right? Like the, the idea is, you know, developers are creatures of habit, number one, and they are only going to adopt something if it makes their life easier, not harder. So oftentimes, if you have the wrong uh, motivations for it and you end up slowing them down and making it more difficult for them, uh, things that used to be easy, uh, then they're just, they'll never adopt the tool. So I think, yes, it absolutely matters. And it's really hard. You know, we, we've kind of at our organization, there's been a bit of both, you know, grassroots and, and you know, top down. Um, but, you know, the, the, grass group, the grassroots can only get you so far. And again, because there's so many, fiefdoms you have to kind of deal with, uh, especially at a company like ours, that you really need someone to, to sort of cut across those those domains and, and really kind of get everyone by, uh, bought into it. Um, but again, if it's not for the right reasons, you're still never will be successful. Yeah, I think the, the, the answer is very similar to theirs, but I also would like to add on top of that, uh, the challenges that I've had with just the grassroots or just the top down. Uh, basically, if I have a top-down initiative, no one follows it unless they feel like they were part of it, right? Or if it's grassroots, it just stays within a silo of an organization. What I've seen recently at OWN is that we've had the top-down initiative of, for example, efficiency or better observability, and there's funding there, which is good. Um, the challenge is, until I had a great engineer run that project, 
that knew how to branch out to the various groups. This is Kevin, if anyone was wondering. We'll talk about Kevin a lot, but he was able to branch out and he's got these folks just cheering for him when he's fixing things, you know? Or he's, yes, logging. Who's excited about logging? Only Kevin, and now he's got a whole group of people and they're from all different areas and they're seeing the benefit immediately. Instead of focusing on the cleanup effort that he wanted to fo focus on, which is the standardization, the top down, you must do this. He was able to find the things that would move the needle for each team, work, work on those first. And now when we try to apply the pressure for the standardization, it's just a no brainer to them. It's part of the process. They weren't even thinking and they're, they're all bought in. They're Kevin's best friend, right? And I think you all need a Kevin. I can't emphasize this enough. My Kevin's <laughs> name is Jeff. It's okay, same thing. you've got a Jeff. Okay. Yeah. I, I would state this a little more bluntly and say you have to have both. Yeah. And you straight up have to have both. And another thing that probably people won't be super surprised by: leaders get it wrong all the time. Yes. And you know, I have seen more than a few leaders say, "This is what our developers need," and they went and built it, and no one cared. And it's because you're not really solving a real problem or you're, you, you know, you're making an assumption on what, you know, the, the challenges that they have on a day-to-day -day basis. I see this happen all the time with dev portals. We need a dev portal because Gartner said 80% of us are going to do it. So I better go do it this year. And, you know, so you need that top-down funding, but you need to talk to your developers what are their actual problems like you know how do you go and make their day-to-day -day better you know developer satisfaction as a whole is such a huge impact on developer productivity and not even just developer productivity people productivity like if you are happy you are going to do a better job you are going to be more pleasant you are not going to spread your nasty attitude to everyone else and you know that is a real thing and if you can just remove those roadblocks from people, it, it makes their life better. But that can't happen without leadership from top, and it can't happen without the knowledge and experience from the bottom. And that's where the magic really happens as far as I see it. Yeah, that's something we hear a lot as, as we talk to, funny you mentioned backstage, because the whole idea of like IDPs, because we need it. Yeah. Um, talking to developers, something that you know, Arvin mentioned, uh, Rita mentioned, now, now all of you did as well. Um, is this, in your experience, a way to measure that your initiatives are succeeding? Or what other tools, practices are you using to say, yes, I'm investing in the right thing? Is, you know, we mentioned cost reduction. What else are you using to say, this is the right thing to do? I, I mean, we use the standard DORA metrics. I love to just basically sit, figure out if MTTR is is it's going down these are easy things to measure and it's not every human that you're worried about it's actually a, an overall measurement that helps me understand if we're headed in the right direction um, those okrs are at the top they tell me i should focus on mttr mtt uh, repair and and detect right so mttd um, and figure out how i can reduce that time because that's Again, for my customer, my end customer, not the internal customer, my end customer, what I really need to achieve. Um, there's other internal metrics, but I will tell you, counting lines of code are not it. Uh, I just, I think that that is just a, it's a, it's a, it's the wrong metric, and you're going to incentivize the wrong behavior by engineers. They'll get very competitive, and they'll just write extra code for no reason. Um, I, I think you need to actually measure them based on what is delivered and the value of the thing. That's why product management comes in really well, both in my team in platform and in the engineering teams, of course. But even in platform, our products that we deliver, whatever it is, observability or whatnot, we should have an OKR related to that. That's the measurement of productivity of that engineering team. Did they deliver on that OKR? I know it's a little nebulous and some people don't like that, but even as a, I mean, I'm a senior leader at our company, I recognize that trying to see every, you know, maybe it's bugs that they allow them to prod, okay? But that's a blame game and you're going to get bad behaviors because of it. I don't know, that's just my opinion on it. <laughs> to the measuring lines of code, something that came out of one of our hackathons is the, the Wally Award. 
uh, Wally from the movie. And so it's the person who's deleted the most lines of code this hey. month and it's turned into something that's like, like regularly that. celebrated. And we're pretty remote. So our CEO, our CTO will make a video and send out an actual like glass cube to the winner. And it's really cute. So that's a, a fun one to kind of incentivize. Till they delete the thing we need, but, <laughs> but it's so, okay. <laughs> I'm assuming it's deleting without like melting things. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but so at Spotify, when we first started thinking about developer experience, a metric that worked really well was like how long until a new engineer has committed 10 commits. Yeah. And that worked. We were growing really fast. This is back in like the 2014, 2016 era. Um, at SeatGeek, that doesn't make sense. And so we really do lean on a lot of, um, of course, Dora, but like the, uh, how are people feeling? We have a survey that goes out twice a year around your experience inside of your team. And then we latch on some, how is your dev environment into that? Um, we do regular customer surveys and um, we build strong relationships. So like when things are really painful, we start to hear it. Um, we're in our back end operations guild, so back end engineers. So kind of use that more uh, yeah, like and, sentiment based. Yeah, and I mean for us, I mean the way I guess I, I kind of look at it is, the generally the application delivery teams know where the pain points are, and really like the the sort of quickest wins or whatever are going to just be okay. Let's talk to those those dev teams, figure out organizationally where are our bigger pain points, and then what me metrics make sense for that specific pain point. You know, is it how long does it take me to go from my you know, decide I want to build a new app to, I now have an app, you know, a, a code base I can contribute to, or it's pull requests that are taking forever, or my feedback loop takes too long because our pipeline takes too long to run, whatever it might be, right? Like any of those are going to sort of change for organization. And then I would say, don't let people know the metrics that you're going to be looking at <laughs> so that they can't necessarily game it because a lot of those are going to be like the lines of code and things like that. So, you know, I don't think they're necessarily, um, here are like the five metrics that matter. And then, and like, there, there's much more fine grained, like if you have this problem, these are the ones that matter. I mean, obviously the Dora ones are important and you should be tracking things like that. But ultimately the, the sort of easiest way to do it is, is go attack, attack specific pain points and, and see what you can do there. The, the, the biggest challenge I have here, and I could go on and on about this topic, um, is it, there's no easy answer to this. And this takes really good leadership because the Dora metrics and space metrics are great, but they're directional. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're, if you're talking to your C-suite, they're not going to understand most of those, if we're going to be honest about it. Like, especially for the non-technical folks. If you're talking to your CFO, he does not know what deployment frequency really means. Like, you could try to explain it. But so your audience really matters. And what is the information that you want to give them? So if you're talking to your C-suite, you should be converting metrics into things that a non-technical person can understand. If you're a CTO, you you know, door metrics are fine, space metrics are fine, but those are directional at best. And we all know Goodhart's law is a real thing that, you know, once a measure becomes a metric, it's no good anymore. Um, and where the leadership comes in is there's all these leading indicators. Like I actually don't mind time to 10th commit, but, I, you have to have that with multiple other things. Like how, you know, what is your time to 10th commit and a survey question around how comfortable are you deploying to your code base? Because you might be able to do 10 commits in a month, but your code base might be an absolute disaster. That's really hard and hard to deal with. And the, you know, one of the things that I see a lot of is when people get addicted to metrics is they have a dashboard that's got 500 of them on there. And, and you can look at it and every given day, some are going down and some are going up and you look at it and go, I don't know what's different. I, I, I cannot tell in anything that's happened. And, and the way to solve that is by being targeted. And what are the things that you want to optimize for? And this is where strong leadership comes in. You know, what are the things that matter? You know, what are we trying to drive? Are we trying to drive down incidents? Are we trying to drive better quality? Or what are we trying to do? Because if you're trying to do everything, you're doing nothing. And that's when these leading indicators come in that you can start to measure them and only measure them for a certain amount of time. Like measure them while you're trying to improve something. Okay, well, I stood up a developer portal. I implemented contract testing to decrease, you know, rollbacks when it comes to deployments. Great. Once that's done, stop tracking that metric. 
And if it becomes a problem again, then start start measuring it again. You have to simplify and you have to give people something to work towards. If it's this ambiguous, nebulous thing that nobody can understand, you're really gonna struggle. Your engineers are gonna struggle. Nobody knows what direction to go in. And it and you when you don't know where to go, you kind of go nowhere and you start to get into protectionism. And that's when things start to, you know, stagnate across an engineering organization. And that's that to me is a real leadership problem. I, I just want to point out the protectionism that you just, this is really key. And when we started measuring bugs per team, oh, just bugs per team, that all they me measured was how many bugs they couldn't report, yeah. right? So they would end up trying not to report bugs or hide them behind something else or group them as one just to not have a bugs per team metric high. So we tried to reduce that and change that to close metric. Like how quickly are you closing bugs? They just close them and not fix them. I mean, I'm not kidding. This was, it, you have to incentivize, remember the behavior you're incentivizing by putting these goals in place. And I like the idea that you said, and I think all of us said in some ways of finding the goal you're trying to achieve. What are you trying to unblock? I just wanted to point out because yeah. I've seen it so many times that we've measured the wrong thing. The, the other thing that I would, this is a cultural thing that I think is incredibly valuable, is in any type of developer experience, or especially when you start going down the metrics road. Like nobody likes to be micromanaged and nobody wants to be micro measured. And then the second one is do you have to do developer experience or measuring with the community and not to the community and if you have a a culture that is high pressure high productivity we sprint until sprints are sprints i mean if you do 24 sprints in a row is it a sprint anymore that's a marathon right and so if you have this culture of just go 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 you're gonna get a lot of negative reaction when it comes to measures and metrics and those kinds of things. And I feel like I beat up leaders all the time, but it takes a really good set of leaders to set the right culture, to set the right focus, and to drive these things forward. Yeah, I can agree more. Like leadership's clear and working with the community. I love what you said about nobody likes to be micromanagement or micromeasure. That's, nobody that's wants a good to nobody wants that's to a good way to, to to put it. So before we open it to the to the audience, uh, my, my final question for you all is when you look forward the next 12 to 24 months, what's exciting? What What is the next big thing you're looking to to create, to build, to kind of help your team get through when it comes to this world of like platform, dev experience, velocity? Yeah, so uh, it wouldn't be 2024 without saying this. We're really excited about smart platform, which is our way of not saying AI platform. Um, but uh, being able to identify, okay, first let's pull our metrics system metrics that are visible to all of our engineers who are having owned more of their infrastructure, then how can we make things that a machine can and should be able to learn and do automatically on a platform simple? So really going from this lift and shift effort we've been moving from Nomad to Kubernetes to actually now taking advantage of all the signals we have to do fun things. So I know it sounds sad, but do more with less is one of the key things. We're in a downturn market or down market. So we have to, I know that it doesn't seem like that some days, but you know, the gas prices and all, I'm joking. But the ba basically, you know, we do need to figure out our optimizations and that's kind of a goal of ours. And, and with that, I, I, I want to jump on the AI bandwagon. So interestingly enough, I've been looking at ways that we can reduce the need for not just the automation and toil reduction, but mostly documentation creation. Because I will tell you, I mean, well, rather, how many engineers in the room like to document their stuff? I do, actually. <laughs> so you and I, okay? There's two of us out of all. But basically, I can't get that information on paper or rather in a confluence or somewhere where we can actually have proper run books and such. And I've been looking into that technology. So uh, overlying the focus on optimization, focus on moving to Kubernetes and that helping us optimize, but at the same time, overlaying some AI tooling that will in a protected way in our very data protection focus, <laughs> um, allow us to automate things that people don't like doing. I met, I was at a client the other day that had 95,000 Confluence pages. 
Sounds you think right. ninety-five thousand and one is going to help your knowledge management problem? <laughs> no, probably no. not. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly. I don't want them documenting anymore. I right. want them to. I want smart documentation, exactly right? right? I think maybe that's the yeah. that's my new term, smart documentation. I'm going to. I'll I'll, I'll put up a new my own company about it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, it's it's everything that we can do to make the mundane not a thing you have to do anymore, right? So, I mean, simple things like even stuff like Dependabot and things like that to maintain your your dependencies so that they're not going to be, you know, going outdated. Like all those those tasks that either devs don't want to do or get forgotten or difficult, things like that are, you know, as much as we can do to, to kind of enable those things to go away. Um, that's one thing that you know, I definitely want to see. And obviously, Dependabot's not exactly new, but I think there's a lot more tooling coming out around a lot of these types of things. And, and, and really, at least for me personally, it's on top of that, like, what can we layer into the sort of you know, co contribution process, right? How can we make that contribution process easier? Whether it's, you know, not automated code reviews, not necessarily, but, you know, basically having a PR and, and having uh, something be able to analyze it and say, here's the stuff you should probably look at, right? Like, I still want to set eyes on it, but, you know, let's let's cut through all the fluff. There's, you know, 200 files someone changed for some reason. Oh, most of these just got, you know, spacing changed or whatever it might be. And, um, so, so that type of stuff, I think, is is ultimately you know what I'd like to see because I think at the end of the day, it's it's you know as much as the AI hype uh, you know bandwagon is is going full force, it's it's less about oh this is now going to do our job and it's more about this is going to give us better visibility or going to take you know cognitive load off of us so that we don't we can focus on what's actually important. Yeah, I'm actually happy that people are starting to to think about developer experience in, in more of a real way. Um, and not just because I'm the head of developer experience, but it, it, you know, there's a, you kind of need a downward pressure. I mean, we've, we've, companies have grown and grown and grown and grown and grown. And when, when sales are good and when things are always going faster, you know, you can kind of forget about efficiencies and, you know, you need some of that pushback to be able to start to optimize and, you know, solve problems and challenges and knowledge management is a humongous problem for just about everybody and you know how do you start to resolve some of those challenges is key and and without a focus on you know kind of optimization whether it's through kind of engineering effectiveness or developer experience it, it it's that's how you're going to make yourself much more efficient and that's you know i'm super excited about it me too. I've been working on DevX before it was called DevX. It's yeah. so exciting that it's yeah. now a thing. Uh, and amazing to see leaders like you, like who care about this and are pushing this to to your teams in such a sophisticated ways. Uh, so I'm sure I could ask so many more questions, but I'm sure the audience has has questions of their own. So if anybody um, has any questions for the panel, please fire away. Ask us our AI strategy again. <laughs> in your organizations, what are methods you you're taking or opportunities you're creating for it and developers right all the, the dependency teams platform engineering others to uh, better collaborate uh and move away from that protective mindset what are the things you everyone here is doing towards that i'll, I'll double down on what you were saying before with smaller teams like it, I see so many teams that are 10, 12 people and that amount, that big of a team requires scrum masters or product owners and lots of overhead to be able to make them happen. But if you have a team of three or four, you can basically self-organize and you can still provide a lot of that same value and, and you know, insights into what you're doing. And it, it takes better leadership. It takes a little bit better organization, but you know, smaller teams are the way you're going to be able to actually deliver more faster with a higher level of quality, in my opinion. So I'll, I'll piggyback on the, the smaller teams. I did that for observability. It's working well. I think to even double down on that though, the engineers are not part of the observability team. They're just like customers of the observability team. What I've done to try to speed up some of those co-dependent projects um, is if an, grab an engineer, grab a DevOps engineer or infrastructure engineer,
Greb is an observability person, grab a QA person that can help make sure everything is tested, perhaps, and put them on a guild of sorts. That's what we've actually been calling it is a guild. I know you have a different definition of guild, but it's actually helping us figure out and test whether these types of small teams can speed up delivery. And, and we're not measuring velocity all the same, but I would say if they estimate two months and they deliver in one and a half, that's amazing. What we've seen in the past is they estimate two months and they deliver in six. So I'm what I'm trying to see is what's the overall metric that I can kind of reduce at a delivery metric. And if I can pull team members from all different angles, give them one lead and allow them to move. That that really does help. I've seen it once, now I'm trying to produce it again. Um, some A problem I love solving, which I have a problem, is how do you make organizations effective from your development teams all the way up to like your entire engineering organization? Um, and I think something that's critical is being aligned, having your leadership teams aligned. So something I do is develop a lot in um, building relationships with my counterparts, knowing what problems they have, because if we're not aligned, it's going to be a little bit annoying in our conversations and a shit show in our teams. They're going to be running different things. They're going to be fighting each other. It's going to be a mess. It's like first and foremost is getting that good relationship with your uh, counterparts and then setting up ways to uh, have an accountability. And so we have ops reviews in all of our different orgs that we use weekly or biweekly. You're looking at the traditional door type metrics, incidents that have happened, it's also now become an accountability measurement. Like, cool, if I'm rolling out a new um, SLAs for action items out of incidents, I'm gonna go talk to each of these ops reviews. I'm gonna turn to them to expect people are actually um, taking action and it gives a distributed accountability mechanism. Uh, and then the third one I'll say is internal mobility is your biggest friend. At Spotify, I led the ads team. We all had premium subscriptions in Spotify. No one looked at the ads experience. When someone wanted to jump out of the ads team, go for it because now you're going to be another team that actually understands this use case that is pivotal to us as a company. And same thing at SeatGeek, rotating myself in from a product team, bringing my Jeff in from a product team, like we're bringing that understanding of what it's like to be in, in a different type of team. And if it's through a permanent move or embeds, like you get that knowledge and understanding and it's much easier to collaborate because you know the humans, you know their pain. Yeah, and, and for us, I, I think where we've found the most success is whenever we need to um, either have uh, reach out to another team that's got, you know, owning something that, that we kind of either need some changes to or interface with, um, not showing up as a problem, not coming there and saying, hey, I'm just a problem that you now have to deal with and I'm, I've got work for you. Um, you know, really, truly being a partner and then, you know, actually thinking through this is, you know, kind of what our vision is and having a, a, an intelligent conversation with them around here's where we'd like to go and by the way if you need some help you know we can take some engineering resources and help you out uh you know we're, we're not necessarily um you know on the teams that uh, were contributing to some of their their repositories but if we're willing to then there's a lot more reciprocative you know kind of willingness there so that's one thing that we found some good success with uh i'm sure uh you know you guys have all faced this where you know you have key man dependency across your team right there are a few folks in the team who know pretty much everything that you run and they kind of end up kind of jumping into those problems and takes away from the other folks who really, you would like them to kind of step up and kind of pick that up, right? But they are too overwhelming for the folks who actually want to learn and come. So what is your thought on uh, any of this? Yeah, I mean, I think things like pair programming are great for that, right? Um, you know, really thinking through and, and oftentimes, you know, one thing that I found is, is really useful when you're especially dealing with some of the more juniors is letting them kind of see some of your thought process, right? Like not necessarily being this oracle that's like, here's how you do it, go do it. But really letting letting them like see you think through because of this, this is why we should do it this way and et cetera. Uh, and then actually sort of, uh, you know, pair programming with them and saying, okay, like I'm gonna let you take this. Uh, we can either do it together or, you know, you can have a couple of days, uh, you know, see what you do and then kind of come back and, and talk through and say, okay, here's, Here's, I like what you did here. I think we could have done this differently here. I think um, being willing to invest that time and not see that as a, a waste of a resource because now you have two people doing the same same job. Uh, it's not the same job. <laughs> so I think having the willingness to do that really, I think helps a lot. I, I think there's, um, there's a bunch of different ways you can pair. Um, 
I had a really interesting conversation with the head of product over at Tuple the other day, and he kind of enlightened me on a couple of these things. But, you know, I, I know like ThoughtWorks has always been a big push for pair programming, but I think there's more than one way you can kind of pair with somebody. There's the, you know, going and kind of co-writing code, which was a lot of the, the push before, but, you know, sometimes people just need to try to hack through a problem themselves. I know I'm very guilty of this, like, you know, um, and the way, like when I was in my junior career, that's a lot of the way that I learned was kind of hacking my way through it. But sometimes I get a little stuck and, you know, I'm, I'm looking for somebody to help me get unstuck, not for someone to come in and solve the solution, like kind of what you were saying. And, and you know, having that kind of a culture that you can, you can do those kinds of things. And it's like, you know, in the end, we're trying to grow our, our junior folks into senior folks. We're trying to spread the knowledge of our senior folks to everyone else. And, you know, by having these kind of rigid mechanisms of, you know, you must pair program and you must be doing this like four hours a day or whatever, I think is the wrong way of thinking about it. And by, you know, sometimes you want to do that if it's something really complex it's a it's a you know in a lot of organizations there's this function or set of code that no one can touch because you know nancy wrote it seven years ago and left five and it'll break the whole company like you know there's reasons to pair but there's also reasons just for bouncing an idea off of somebody or whatever and and by allowing people the leverage to be able to do that i think that's how you spread knowledge and build build kind of a community inside of a team and in the end drive better productivity one of my staff engineers fits this bill and he's relatively new to the company, like two years now, but he very quickly became that person. So it wasn't because they'd been there forever and done everything. In one of our one-on-ones we were talking about, he said, well, yeah, I have Slack alerts set up for like keywords of things I've recently been working on. So people start talking about it in channels, like I'll know something's breaking. And I'm like, you're talking about that show and tell. So he literally had a show and tell, which you do bi-weekly of like, here's all the things I have set up in Slack. And here's how I have my IDE set up. And I use the same, uh, like the same font and color scheme in GitLab and my ID so I can quickly see things. There's all these like micro optimizations he had made. I'm like sharing, pairing, like your way of working is gonna be so much faster than um, like tell people how we got to that spot so they can start emulating those best practices. Um, so early days, we just did that. We'll see if it helps. <laughs> I like this idea. I, I was thinking about it. We do not do pair programming today. We do pair projecting. I know that I just made that up today at this moment. <laughs> but basically, I'll take a senior engineer, somebody who's done this work before, or maybe something similar, someone who I can't pick the brain of because they won't sit down long enough with me. Um, but I'll pair them with a newer engineer or someone who hasn't touched that code before. And pretty much, they're not touching the code at the same time. Maybe one of them will do one component, one will do the other, but they are working together to a common goal and they are sharing a common or shared understanding. My biggest challenge right now is doing that across many time zones. And that's, you know, I have a, a, have a group that is really smart, been there forever, knows everything in a separate time zone from the group that's newer. Um, but what we've been trying to do is do the four hour overlap in the morning, for example, those things have happened. Uh, we're not ex extremely successful with it, but one, you know, shipping people into location is also a great way of getting things, in, you know, infused into their brain for the first uh, few months. I would also say knowledge management has a big I was, gonna, yeah, I was going to uh, talk about it about again. But. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, knowledge management is such a problem in almost everywhere you want to look. And, you know, uh, yeah. it, related to the same question, what Darwin asked. When we were a small, we were able to help the developers whenever they need it, go with them and all. But now we are growing, they are expecting the same. How do you envisage you know, 100 people were there? service immediately but you now thousand people are there the same team or maybe grow like double or three times but the developers are expecting much more the developers are expecting a much more the same set of service how do you envisage when you grow a company small company to big company how do you get that level of support and the developers what they need and at the same time devops and they follow the process and everything. As you grow and have bigger or larger customer base, you have to find a way to automate yourself, automate that knowledge. I, I don't know uh, your situation, but what I've seen work well is if I produce a platform or a tool or something that is easily adoptable, then I don't have to handhold through that process. 
Um, I would say right now we're, we're at a different stage at this company because we are doing that very tight coupling because we need it for that first phase of moving everything to Kubernetes. Once we're there, we should be able to rinse and repeat. Um, I, I don't have a good answer for that as I, most of my companies have been early to moving from early to late stage startup. When we get to the next level, you probably have centers of excellence, you have folks who are documenting trainings, they're doing it during onboarding. So it doesn't, it's more teaching to fish than it is doing it together, fishing together. I, I think that's what I've seen. Something that we've done, because we're in this journey, is inside of our platform org, we have many teams, they've changed names, they've changed distributions, and like no one should have to understand that. Half our team doesn't understand that. So we have like one platform questions channel, and we actually have a rotation of engineers who are on there, and they're able to like route to an expert team. And that's working right now. Uh, we're going to hit an upper bound of that where it doesn't make sense to have our engineer looking at that. And we have models of some of our product engineering teams who have a lot of business stakeholders. We actually brought in a, a technical program manager. They set up a thing where you're triaging. And, and so we have this ability of how to mature this and still have a good response time. Um, so I think it's kind of taking that approach, but definitely encourage trying to centralize the intake because that's going to give you as a leader visibility into like when it's become too much, what are the trends, the ability to actually analyze the type of problems that are coming to you. Yeah, and, and one thing that we've um, found some success with, I think is at least in our organization and probably in most organizations, there's there's sort of the different business units or whatever it might be where there's groups of developers. And within each one of those groups of developers, everyone knows, oh, who's the go-to person, right? Like, oh, that's 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 who you want to go and talk to because they know everything or they're, they're the ones who are sort of the, the keys of that area. And by targeting them and sort of uh, making them almost an extension of yourself, where you, you really want to partner, look closely with them and make sure that they really understand the, the, the platform and, and how it all works, then ultimately they're going to be the one that the people around them go to. So it kind of takes uh, some load off of you. Obviously things like documentation and 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 again, I, I love the, the fact that you point out, making it as easy to use as possible and really truly caring about what does my, my user interface look like, whether that be the tooling, if you're building a CLI tool, make sure it's got extremely good you know interface or whether it's um, a website or whatever it might be. If it's as easy to use as possible, it's gonna lower those, but then for the things that are just naturally complicated, then you have the sort of first line of defense out there as, as those sort of key people. I look, I look at it as, you know, just kind of a little bit of repeating, but you have to abstract away complexity. But one of the things that I see people, one of the mistakes I see people make is they abstract away complexity and then they never give back any real information. So like developers in the, fr like the first stage are like, yeah, please take that hard thing away from me. But in the end, they also want to know what's going on. And so abstract away complexity while giving them good feedback is a great way of, of you know, building that connective tissue all the way through that process and, you know, doing a good job of, and this goes back to kind of product management a little bit, of all of those questions that you're getting back, you know, the challenges people are having, building that kind of continuous improvement cycle that says, look, like I can now Im improve the abstracted, you know, complexity and improve the feedback coming back to the developer. And that, you know, as you scale, that's going to be the way that you're not scaling through humans. Because if you're scaling with people, you, you are going to hit the, you know, that's when knowledge management problems come in. That's when you get all kinds of issues when it comes to scale. And, you know, as you think about developer portals as your kind of single pane of glass of where do you want to put this stuff, it's a great feedback loop mechanism. And that's where scale to like, it scales hard, but you have to follow those simple rules and you'll, you'll have a lot better success. Great. Well, thank you so much for this. It was amazing. So much information flowing. Sorry for the questions. Um, please give me a round of applause for our speakers. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thanks so much.